Hello, Star Trek fans. Welcome to Rebinge It. This is the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we are rebinging Star Trek Voyager from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are on Season 2, Episode 22, Innocence. This episode aired April 8th, 1996. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode? Something I did not point out. Mm -hmm. This was actually the second time Harry has died in the series so far. (laughs) Oh, that is a good point. It probably happens again. We talked about this episode a little bit more afterwards, and I'm kind of annoyed about it because yeah, I think it's a really good episode, but they make some mistakes that make it not a great episode, and that's just so <laughs> disappointing. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, and anyone who's listened to the podcast, I think you went over them in a lot of detail. Yeah, I do think I covered my problems with the episode. It just <laughs> yeah. It's like it continued to annoy me because I wanted it to be better. Yeah. Well, anything else to say about last week's episode? Oh, yeah. It's not the last time Harry dies either. Oh, so you did think of another time? (laughs) Oh, yeah. I can think of two. Oh, my gosh. Poor Harry. He's like Miles. He is. He is absolutely the Miles O'Brien of this season. Well, let's get going on this episode. You have the notes. Yes, I do. We open with yet another crash shuttle. Fortunately, Voyager has over 300 of them. Plus the team of folks building and repairing new ones that is going on constantly. Yeah, but we get this shuttle back. This one's fine. Tuvok is attending to a severely injured crewman. It's really bad. And we lose him in under two minutes. It's so grim. I mean, the poor guy wishes he had someone to miss him back home. It's like, oh my God. And then we learn somebody actually will miss him, which makes it even worse. Ensign McCormick. She's not going to be happy about this. Oh. So... When Tuvok scans him, he says that several vertebrae were fractured. That doesn't seem like enough to be fatal on its own. Was Tuvok not telling him the whole story, like saying, oh, you have a couple of fractured vertebrae. Oh, and loads of damaged internal organs, and the internal bleeding is terrible. I don't think that's what Tuvok would do, but perhaps the spinal injury was just more severe than he reported, or than maybe his instruments could read. Oh, yeah. But yeah, just... It didn't seem fatal until yeah. it was. <laughs> I have the opinion of maybe he was understating exactly what was wrong. Mm, maybe. But no, it only took two minutes. And just to make it even sadder, he hasn't told Ensign McCormick that he also likes her or I don't know, you know, they were sort of implying that he didn't know how she felt right as he died. Yeah. But it's like, people, you are stuck on a 70 year mission <laughs> with no chance of meeting any other humans. I think you ought to, you know, be open with each other about yeah. your feelings. I think that's good advice. Tuvok hears a noise in the undergrowth nearby, and we see it's a very young girl called Tressa. She tells Tuvok they came on a ship, but it crashed, and her parents are dead. Turns out she's not alone, as there are two other children hiding in the shrubs. Everyone else died, and they're the only survivors of the crash. Suspicious. Yeah, being an experienced Starfleet officer, shouldn't his first reaction be worried that these children were actually some kind of murderers? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't really remember this episode, and there were a few times at the beginning where I'm like, are they going to turn into, like, (laughs) giant scary aliens, you know, are they just some kind of shape-shifting creature that we don't know about? So, yeah, he should have been concerned about that, too. Turns out they're children of the damned. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Tuvok tells the children he will take care of them and make sure they return home safely, and they all run and hug him. This is definitely going in his blog. These children were displaying unnecessary emotions. Yeah, a lot of them. And we go into the opening titles. On Voyager, Janeway is giving a log. They're analyzing mineral deposits on the moons of Drayon II. She's arranged a meeting with the planet's leaders, but we learn no one has had contact with them for decades. They're not hostile, just very private. Janeway is quite upbeat in this episode, considering what happened last week. <laughs> so this is a first contact situation? Yeah. and. Chakotay does point out they have no idea what to expect, but Janeway is very excited about this. Yeah, she's pretty uh, into it. Chakotay also does tell a story about how, as part of a first contact team, he accidentally made inappropriate hand signals to the new race's ambassador. Mm. So we see Chakotay's skills extend all the way back. (laughs) Yep. Beaming the Drayon on board, 
we're introduced to first prelate Elisa, and they look like they're dressed in some kind of religious robes. And my first thought is, zealots! <laughs> yeah, they're creepy people with creepy <laughs> outfits. Yeah, they're a, they're a little bit worrying. But there are people, like even in America, who live in colonies, and you know they all sort of dress the same. And yeah. that was what I thought they were trying to do here. Yeah. They're all just sort of wearing the same exact thing, yeah. just in slightly different dark colors. So their leaders have very unimaginative dress sense. I guess so. But the veils over their face, that's creepy. Janeway and Chakotay are giving visitors a tour of the ship and end up in engineering. Elisa tells Janeway her ancestors were scientists and engineers until the machines became more important than the people, saying society would have self-destructed if it wasn't for the Reformation. <laughs> Good. Uh-oh. Definitely confirmed zealots. Yeah. But Janeway here has a great look on her face. It's kind of a mix between a very serious and oh crap. Well, she really missed the point of what Janeway was saying. Because she immediately follows it up with the doctrine of her people where we just need to get rid of all technology and keep to ourselves. When Jane was trying to say, we use the technology in order to understand other people. Yeah. Yes. Using it to explore. She reminded me a little bit in this moment of Elixis. Yes. Oh, did you have the same thought? Yeah. And even the name, Alicia, it gave that, you know, that That's true. It's thread back to, oh, if we just give up all technology, we'll be great. This is the episode of Deep Space Nine called Paradise, yes. where there was one character who really felt like they had to get back to their true selves yeah. and get away from all technology. It's an episode really about cult leadership. Yeah, it sounded similar to what this character said. Although, you know, even though they're creepy when they first arrive, she does give this little, I don't know, blessing or saying where she says, may this day find you at peace and leave you with hope. And I thought, that's a, that's a Star Trek ideal. <laughs> Right yes. there, but it still came across as slightly creepy. Continuing, Elisa says, They remained isolated to avoid the influence of those who made lead us down the wrong path. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suppose the cult leader is the one who knows the correct path in all things. Let's ban some books while we're <laughs> at it, I mean. Back to the crash shuttle, and we learn that attendants aboard the kids' ship put them in escape pods before they crashed. The shuttle is damaged and they can't leave, but Tuvok thinks he can repair it. We also learn that the atmosphere suffers from electrodynamic turbulence in the ionosphere, which is what caused the shuttle crash in the first place. Bad things in the atmosphere causing a shuttle or runabout to crash? Is that not a Star Trek staple, if ever there was? And let me guess, sensors don't work, communication <laughs> doesn't work, and we can't beam wow, through it. it's like you know what's going to happen. Mm. There's some banter with the kids about wanting to leave and them being hungry. Tuvok is being a very logical Vulcan here, and clearly not an expert with children who have emotions. Yeah, the one kid says, I don't like it here. <laughs> and Tuvok says, your displeasure doesn't change our situation, nor does it bring us any closer to a solution. I thought those were actually pretty good words for just this week as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The kids do seem to be behaving very much like small children, so I, I don't <laughs> yeah. think there's anything to worry about with them for the time being. Yeah, they don't seem dangerous. They're yeah. like, I want food. I want this particular kind of food. And then they're like, I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm this. I'm like, we have to go. We have to go right now. It's like, okay, chill out. The young girl called Tressa tells Tuvok they can't be there at night as that's when the Morok comes and explains how the Morok is a creature that takes you when you die. And the little boy says it lives in a cave. And in an amazing coincidence, the crash shuttle is right next to the cave. <laughs> That's what I thought, too. I'm like, how did we manage to land right next to that cave? <laughs> so now we have something to worry about. Scanning the cave, Tuvok cannot detect anything. But the kids insist it's there, telling him there were two other children with them and they were taken while they were sleeping. The girl tells him, tonight it will take us. Mia. Back to Voyager, and Janeway is explaining the Federation to the Zealots, and she takes him to sickbay. The Doctor must have downloaded some new protocols, as he's actually quite polite and charming. There's some discussion of the Dreon's spirituality, but it's interrupted by an urgent message for the prelate. We also do learn that Kess has been coaching the Doctor on his diplomatic skills. Mm -hmm. Janeway tells the Doctor they want to open trade negotiations, as they still need polyferonide. Returning, the prelate tells Janeway she's been called away on an emergency, thanking them for the visit and telling Janeway 
it would be better if she and her crew continued their journey. Because at the end of the day, the Dreyans just want to honour the tradition of avoiding close contact with outsiders. So that didn't go very well. No, and Janeway seems like she gives up really easily. Like, oh well. Yeah. I noticed when they were standing in sick bay. Yeah. One of the shots showed them all kind of standing in their drab outfits. Yep. And it's almost like they were darkness. Like they were sort of pulling from the lights. And oh. Like, I just thought that was really interesting how they almost sort of disappeared into the scene. They just seemed very sort of somber, I think. Yeah. The other thing here that's actually kind of funny is, did you notice the Dreyans after they say, yeah, you should just leave. They just walk out of sickbay. Yeah. Nobody's following them. They didn't have an escort. Do they know the way back to the transporter room? Yeah. Do you allow alien cultists to just wander around the decks? I mean, maybe there were escorts who were still waiting outside the door or something. But yeah, that did seem funny. Well, Janeway makes the decision. The Dreyans have made their wishes clear. She orders the recall of all the scouting parties. On the moon, with the shuttle, Tuvok is investigating the two missing children. With the other kids in tow, who insist it was the Morok that got them. The kids plead to leave, saying they're scared. And Tuvok goes 100% Vulcan, telling them Vulcan children learn to detach their emotions at an early age. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, pull it together. He does an interesting exercise here in teaching the children how to visualize their fear of the Morok and to imagine pushing it away. And I like the way here the other girl asks if he lives his whole life without feeling anything. And Tuvok replies, more accurately, we strive to control our feelings. I thought that was really good. Yeah. This is a theme that comes up through this episode a lot, I think, is expanding what we know of Vulcans, giving them more of a background, you know, how they think, how their emotions work. He's just being very matter of fact, very, this is Vulcan training, this is what we do, this is how we think. I think it's confusing that he tells them he's never scared, um, that he doesn't love his kids, you know, that he doesn't ever feel anything. Yeah. But then he says, no, we control our emotions. And those are not the same things. So I do find that a little bit confusing. In what way? Well, he says he never feels anything. But then he says it's more accurate to say that we control our emotions, not that we don't have emotions. Yes. They're not the same thing. Well. If you're controlling them, then you would feel them sometimes. I think that might just be semantics. That might actually be an error in the writing. Yeah. I get what he's meaning here, which is he still feels those emotions. He just can control them and doesn't allow them to influence him. Yeah. So he is frightened. Yes, he does feel fear, but he has an ability to control it. Hmm. Because, yeah, he says he doesn't. Right. That he's never afraid. Yeah, I think that maybe, oh, he could just be saying that to the kids to try and (laughs) encourage them not to be afraid. Yeah, but he also says we don't lie to our children. (laughs) So I don't know. Maybe he's not lying. He's just telling the truth within a defined set of parameters. (laughs) Sure. Being a Vulcan kid does not sound like fun. Oh, God, no. Like, here's the reality of everything, and now it's time for you to learn how to cope. It's like, (laughs) okay. But then at the same time, is the, the human way of getting kids into fantasy things like the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus... And telling them that good always beats evil and things like that. Is it better to do that and then have them sort of hit the disappointment of adulthood <laughs> where <laughs> everything isn't, you know, everything isn't like that? Yeah. I don't know. I sort of feel like it's better because at least you do get some time as a kid to think everything is okay yeah. and makes sense. And then, you know, then the world stops making sense when you're an adult. Whereas it sounds like the Vulcan kids, you're right out of the gate. You're just like, <laughs> nope. Everything's terrible. Vulcan children must deal with reality from day one. The young kids are being young kids. They have lots of questions and they're being very inquisitive. But Tuvok needs to work on the shuttle, telling them to sit quietly and not touch any of the equipment, like Vulcan children would. Naturally, the kids cause chaos. (laughs) And this, I thought, was a bit of classic Trek with kids. It always ends up in a little bit of chaos. Well, you can't just expect children to sit quietly. You have to give them something. Well, Vulcan children, you can. The kids continue to ask questions about Tuvok's ears and about Vulcan, and he also demonstrates to them a Vulcan meditation technique. Shouldn't this be a little bit of a concern, like teaching Vulcan methods to other races? (laughs) Well, yeah, maybe it violates the Prime Directive or something. Yeah, 
but also he's trying to get himself off the planet and he just he needs time to concentrate on fixing <laughs> right. the ship. So I think it's mostly just like, how do I shut these kids up? Well, the kids seem to be having fun. I mean, one of them's yeah. looking through like some glass magnifier and the other one's yeah. playing with the equipment. They they seem to be just enjoying them, being kids, enjoying themselves. The one thing I'll say here is as a person with anxiety, when somebody tells you to close your eyes and think about something else, it's like, that's just not, <laughs> no. Honestly, that's just going to make it worse. Not really great advice, depending on who the person was. Yeah. This whole scene, I think, again, is it's starting to move the character of Tuvok along. You see more about who he is and his background, which I really like. And Tim Ross makes, really does make it work. Mm -hmm. Because one of the kids asks him about, don't you love your children? And he says about how they're part of his identity and he is incomplete without them. And I really like that because it seemed like a really Vulcan way of saying, well, of course I love my children, but I'm not going to admit that. They're <laughs> just part of my identity. It's hard for me to understand in this scenario, why do they even get married and have children? <laughs> it's it's like, because it is logical. But is it? Yes, it is to continue the race and to pass on the positive genetic traits that they have onto a future generation. Hmm. But wouldn't they also be evaluating the resources on the planet and figuring out whether or not it made actual logical sense to have kids? Oh, I could counter with they do suffer from the ponfar, where they get a little spicy. Yes, but, you know, there is birth control. I'm sure it's legal <laughs> on Vulcan. But um, it's like if you had a farm and you need farm hands, right? That makes sense. Now you need a reason to have kids. But like, why does Tuvok need four kids? Um, Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not sure it's logical, but there's probably, I'm sure someone could headcanon an answer. Because um, technically, if you were just saying it was about furthering the next generation, you would have the same number of kids that you are. You would never have more than two. Hmm. But he has four. Okay. I don't have a good logical reason for that one. Mm -hmm. um, because. Vulcans want to form ultimately a logical empire and take over the universe, but we don't say that bit out loud. That's possible. Well, the peaceful moment doesn't last long as they hear a ship and Tuvok finds it's a Dreon ship, telling them their people have come looking for them. Tressa tells him we have to hide and explains to a confused Tuvok that the Dreans were the ones that sent them there. They sent us here to die. Well, she's not wrong. Tuvok wants to know more about why they would harm them. But the kids plead for help, and then we see a number of armed Dreyans searching the shuttle as Tuvok and the kids hide in the bushes. Hide behind a moon, or a bush. <laughs> the children explain they're brought there for the final ritual. Then the Morok takes them. The scrolls say they should be happy, as when they die, the energy inside them is set free. He agrees to get them back to Voyager until they learn more about the situation. And they hug him again. <laughs> These children are very emotional. They're very huggy. I thought that was an interesting discussion here, where Tuvok talks about the Vulcan Catra and how, as he's gotten older, he has more doubts. Yeah, he says he just accepted it as a child. Yeah. Again, fleshing out the character of Tuvok. I like it because it makes him not a perfect Vulcan. He's not like a cardboard cutout of everything a Vulcan should be. Now, unless they have some kind of scientific evidence that that's actually what happens, yeah. that seems like a kind of emotional thing for Vulcans to believe. Well, for them to have faith in something that you can't see is interesting. Well, the big thing about Vulcans is, didn't Spock in The Search for Spock, The Voyage Home, those two movies, prove that the Catra is real? Mm. Did they talk about it in, <laughs> as that's what it was? Yeah. Well, that's what he transferred to Bones. Uh -huh. As McCoy says later, you know, came back from the dead. Hmm. Then what's Tuvok's problem? He just needs to watch those movies. Certainly watch uh, The Voyage Home. That's definitely the better one. On Voyager, the other shuttles are back, but no word from Tuvok and Bennett. Going to be bad news about Bennett. They head off following Tuvok's iron trail, and we get to see a space shot of a Dragon ship, which looks a lot like a Y-Wing. Yeah, it did. I noticed that too. Of course, the Dragons are being jerks and not responding to hails. <laughs> and then Elisa comes on comms, telling them, this moon is their Cristata, their most sacred ground. Oops. Well, you could have told us that. She informs them they found the shuttle and the dead guy, and they want Tuvok off the moon. Balana can't get a transporter lock, of course, and Janeway doesn't want to send a shuttle down. On the moon, it's now night, and Tuvok is back repairing the shuttle. The kids can't sleep and are scared, and Tuvok ends up singing them a song, Falor's Journey, and we discover Tuvok can sing. Oh, yeah. And he tells a story about 
his son wanting to hear this song that has like 300 <laughs> verses. And that really made me laugh because he goes through this whole thing of Vulcan children. They don't need stories. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I never understand why species do that. But I'm sorry, if your kid is asking before he goes to bed to hear a song that has 300 verses to it, he's doing exactly what these kids are doing. <laughs> See, this is the part I think that comes out in this about Vulcans and emotion and their love for their children. Yeah. It's like, you're lo you're kidding yourself. <laughs> These things do matter to you. Yeah. Oh, and that description of the story. A tale of enlightenment consisting of 348 verses. I admit, I do love a good story and I want to hear more about this tale. Ideally, audiobook with Tuvok playing the lute. <laughs> oh, no. I'm prepared to settle for a graphic novel, though. It's one of those things, I don't know if you had these when you were a kid, but I had like this little record player yeah. and you would get these actual vinyl records that came in a storybook yeah. and you would put the record on the thing and then it would make a little ding, ding, ding and you would turn the page <laughs> of, the, of the book. That's what it should yep. be. Yep. Kids have it too easy now. The next morning, we see two of the children are gone, leaving only Tressa. Tuvok is confused as the shuttle sensors show no life forms or no unusual energy readings during the night, so he's going to investigate the cave. He leaves Tessa behind, who's very upset by this, and I question his leaving her with a phaser. I hope he had it like on just low stun. Yeah, kids with guns, very dangerous. Because you're going to get shot, is what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Tressa is very scared, but Tuvok assures her their best defense is knowledge saying he will return shortly and he will not abandon her. Again, despite the Vulcanness of Tuvok, the way he says that he won't abandon her, it seems so heartfelt. Mm -hmm. Tim Russ managed to make this emotionless character give off emotion when dealing with the kids. Right, yeah, he does seem like he cares. Right. And I guess that he can be trusted maybe more than that he yeah. cares. Tuvok enters the cave and he's still using those annoying wrist-mounted flashlights, which are like <laughs> the worst idea ever. Yeah. They look cool, but they would be terrible. No, they should be little floating bots. Yes, or even shoulder-mounted. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. As he explores the cave, Tuvok finds the purple jumpsuit and boots worn by the small boy Corrin, but no body. And then he finds the purple jumpsuit of Alani. Again, no body. Looking further around, he finds even more jumpsuits. And Tuvok looks very confused and concerned. Back in the shuttle, he tells Tressa he could not find the other children. Nor can he explain what's happening. But she seems kind of resigned to her fate, saying she's going to be next and there's nothing she can do about it. Tuvok's plan is they will leave the moon before sunset. And to lift her spirits, he says she'll help him in repairing the shuttle. Which she seems very excited about. <laughs> yeah. Kids do like it when you keep them part of, make them part of something. On Voyager, they find the Dreyans have sent another shuttle down to the planet. Tuvok finally managed to get comms working, telling Janeway of the young girl and how he believes the Dreyans have come to kill her. But the signal breaks up again. Harry does report that Tuvok's shuttle should be repaired enough to take off. Janeway hails the prelate, offering help in rescue. But the prelate is just as abrasive as ever, brushing off Janeway's offer of help, telling her the planet is a blessed haven and won't allow Janeway down under any circumstance. I guess we shouldn't be surprised that their negotiation and diplomatic skills are a bit rusty. <laughs> I just thought of that. I just wanted to shout, zealot. <laughs> yeah. Janeway goes into total hard case mode now, saying, I'm taking a shuttle to the surface without your permission. I thought that would have been perfect for, bite me, we're going anyway. <laughs> I did like it here when Janeway says, it's not my intention to provoke a conflict. Well, my first thought is, violating the sovereignty of another nation kind of is the definition of provoking a conflict. Yeah, but, but it's not her intent, right? What yeah. she's trying to do is just get her person <laughs> yeah. and get out of there. It's also very much Janeway's mantra of leaving no one behind. Yeah, that's exactly what she's doing. I did, though, wonder, did they get permission yeah. to do these surveys or, you know, or did they just start doing them? Because if they had been talking to these people before, I'm sure they could have said, please stay away from that moon. Right. You know, well, it's OK to go and look on these moons, but that one we kind of would like to keep quiet. Jamie wants Tom to pilot a shuttle to the surface and Harry's figured out how to get through the moon's turbulence. Also, Janeway tells Chakotay if there's any chance of a diplomatic solution, she needs to be down there to see it through. I think the course of action you're taking is kind of the opposite of a diplomatic solution. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I do feel it was Chakotay's job here to point out that last time 
Tom and Janeway took a shuttle. They ended up with salamanders taking over another planet's ecosystem. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think it's too big a risk to let those two go. <laughs> oh, no. They head off to the surface and are immediately pursued by a Dran shuttle. We get a good space shot here of the shuttle leaving the back of Voyager and then the Drayon shuttle chasing it. And this one, more than any other, shows how much inspired by a Y-Wing it looks. And you know I love all the space stuff, but this is great. Yeah. Back to Tuvok and Tressa, and a Drayon search party is closing in on the shuttle. It's repaired just enough for them to take off, and with a little sparking and fireworks at the console, it makes it into the air. You'd think the Drayons would have remembered where the shuttle was, and would have left a yeah. couple of people there to keep an eye on it in case Tuvok came back. Well, I do think originally they thought the pilot was dead, so there wasn't anybody oh. left. But then eventually they did find out, because Janeway told them there was another person there, so then maybe they hit it oh. back. That's what I was thinking. Right, and they were more concerned about finding the kids, so they turned out, found the dead pilot, exactly. and were like, okay, the kids are the priority, find them. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Tuvok is trying to get out of the atmosphere so they can be beamed to Voyager, and Elisa calls on comms. Unconvincingly, she tells Tuvok the child is confused as she only wants to help her, saying if she returns to the surface, she'll answer all her questions. Well, this doesn't work out well. Elisa starts firing at the shuttle, but they're only firing warning shots, but it's still causing damage. Jamie gets comms working and she orders Tuvok back to the surface and they'll follow him down. Now on the surface, Tressa is worried it's getting dark and Tuvok tells her he'll be there with her. Elisa arrives with her goons and a really bad attitude. (laughs) <laughs> telling Tuvok, this is a critical time. He cannot be allowed to interfere. How dare you? Just as Janeway arrives, and being diplomatic, Tom has his phaser out. I didn't notice that. That's funny. Yeah, that's some more of that diplomacy there. Mm-hmm. Elisa wants him to leave, but Tuvok states Tressa had asked for his protection, and he intends to provide it, and don't mess with a determined Vulcan. <laughs> Janeway also does back him up here, so that's some good captaining. Finally, Elisa starts explaining. Tressa has reached the end of her life. She's 96 years old. With their race, the aging process is reversed. She continues saying that the attendants were supposed to be there to help with this process. She was never meant to face this time alone. Tressa tells her they weren't alone. Tuvok was there. He stayed with them and made them feel safe. He told us the Morak isn't real and not to be afraid. And he took care of us. Elisa seems to soften a little, telling Janeway, They become confused at this age. Their memories become clouded. Near the end of life, they reach a point of complete innocence and leave it peacefully. Elisa insists this is a normal biological process. The energy contained in their bodies remains cohesive for a limited number of years, and then it's released. Nothing can change that. It's the natural course of life. All of their race are compelled by a powerful instinct to return to this planet. At the end, asking Tressa if she can feel it. Tressa asks Tuvok to protect her, but he tells her that he cannot protect her from the natural conclusion of life, nor would he try. Vulcans consider death to be the natural conclusion of a journey. There is nothing to fear. Tressa replies, I won't be afraid, not if you're with me. Alicia tells Tuvok, attending a child on the Crisata is an honourable role, and you have fulfilled it well. Janeway apologises for disturbing their traditions, and Alicia admits that, Perhaps they both misjudged each other. Yeah. And Janeway hopes this does not rule out friendship between our peoples. Well, I think most of this is on the Drayans there, but I I guess Janeway should just nod and take the win. (laughs) Yes. Well, we don't know from here if they get to continue negotiations or not. I mean, Janeway tried, right? By saying, let's still be friends. They all leave, and now alone, Tuvok tells Tressa they can wait as long as she likes. Tressa's memory now seems to return, and she says, she knows it's time. Her only regret is leaving her family, and how Tuvok reminds her of her grandson. (laughs) Tuvok says, you'll still be with them, in their thoughts, as you will in mine. He takes her hand, and she leads him to the cave, pausing momentarily before she walks in, followed by Tuvok. The end. It's a really interesting concept. That they've done there. It's yeah. br- like you would say it's a good sci-fi story that yes. doesn't have to be a Star Trek story. Right. I think it's a great sci-fi story. And it's a little gimmicky really until, or at least you think it's a little gimmicky, until the woman explains that we're sort of returning to this innocence. Yes. And that actually is kind of what happens, right? When people uh, get older, they start to forget things and they do become like a little bit more helpless. And, and yeah. so it's, it's accurate. 
But now to watch it in children and to sort of explain it as the normal aging process, it, it becomes more affecting that way. It was just, I don't know, it was just cool. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Did you think, sorry, I'm going into overanalysis in my questions, I guess, but <laughs> did you think that she really didn't remember until that moment? I think that fits with the, they get confused and yeah. their memories become clouded. And I think that was a nice touch that she had this moment of clarity before the mm -hmm. end and said to Tuvok, oh, you remind me of my grandson. Yeah, that was cute. All right. Well, do you have some overanalysis of this episode? I think I do. Mm -hmm. At least Tuvok perhaps seems to have reached some common ground with the Dreyans. Yeah. Maybe that would help pape over <laughs> with Janeway's uh, less diplomatic approach. Yeah, I guess you could look at it a couple of ways. Yeah. One. They see the respect that Tuvok treated the children with. Yes. And he was really just being protective. He right. wasn't trying to do anything bad. And I think they saw that. And the fact that the kid was like ready for Tuvok to be the whatever she called attendant. It, the attendant at yeah. the end. Tuvok was filling that role of the attendant. Yeah. I think that probably softened her perspective. Yeah. But additionally... When Janeway just stepped in and said, oh, well, we're going to do this because Tuvok said. Right. You know what I mean? That also was something I think really interesting for somebody outside to see. Here she drops in with no information, but she's going <laughs> to, you know, she's going with what her person says. Yeah. Well, and she's prepared to protect this child. Yeah, because Tuvok says they should. And just without question, she's like, OK, I trust him. Yeah. So I think that, too, is pretty telling. That's interesting. So you yeah. think that allowed Elisa to make a moral evaluation of these people and go, oh, m maybe they are good people. Maybe. Yeah. At some point, it, it might have just purely been what she saw in Tuvok and how, yes. you know, the, the girl trusted him. It certainly could have just been that. But if you're going to really overanalyze, as you like to do, it's entirely possible that she's realizing, OK, wait, I don't understand these people because yeah. I've been keeping to myself. They don't understand me, but I also don't understand them. <laughs> so, you know, maybe yeah. she was willing to take a leap there in that moment and go, OK, I overreact. <laughs> but it, it's hard to believe that because people who cut themselves off, they're not they're not just going to turn. Yeah, They're not terribly willing to be open minded. No, exactly. Because they seriously, they are banning books and they are trying to keep themselves closed <laughs> off because they don't want to learn anything new. And they want to make sure that none of their youth, who I guess are old people, um, become interested in science and technology and, you know, becoming too educated for their station. So that's a scary kind of that's, people. Yeah. There's a lot of questions about that race. Mm. Leading on from that, I think a big part of this is it's a story also about a lack of communication. Right. They weren't prepared to yeah. communicate. And it, it's hard to see a fault in the way Janeway was behaving. Oh, yeah. She was being very reasonable. Because she was mm -hmm. being very open. And these people were relying on this, you're outsiders, you'll uh, infect our right. culture. Yeah. Or they just heard through the grapevine that Voyager leaves chaos <laughs> in its path. Well, no, because they don't talk to anybody. So they shouldn't have known anything. Yeah, right. They yeah. wouldn't have heard any of the stories. Right. But she jumped to the conclusion of ill intent, right? When she was telling Janeway, no, yeah. just get your person, get off of there. And she's like, well, I can't beam them back. I have to go and get them. No, you can't go down there. It's just like, OK, then what the hell do you want? <laughs> yeah, there was a level of unreasonability. Yeah. Which happens, I think, because you've cut yourself off and you think everything that's not you is wrong. Oh, you're just yeah. being dumb. I think maybe that's part of the flaw with the Dreyans. I mean, I'm joking about the banning books, but I'm not joking because that is the problem. You've cut yourself off. You're not willing to evolve because you've made some decision, Alexis. Well, <laughs> ideas, <laughs> ideas are dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> I... Ideas that don't follow your cult mm -hmm. leader are dangerous. I mean, that was the story of Paradise. Yeah. Next thing. And we kind of touch on that. I guess the whole problem was because the other ship crashed, the attendants, they were killed in the crash. And in a nice storytelling turn, when she said, oh, my parents are dead, you assumed her parents were the ones on the ship that crashed. Oh, right. Yeah. No, the attendants were the ones who crashed. Yeah. On the ship. Yeah. 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 That was a nice little storytelling mm. touch. Yeah, they've been dead for 60 years or something. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Next thing, ownership of planetary systems. This leads back to your comment of, so they hadn't got permission and they were just scanning these worlds. 
is this normal protocol? If you go into a system, do you scan the moons and the other things before you ask for it? Or is it one of those, you know, we're going to do this because the owners might say no? Well, I think the scanning is one thing, but the sending out the scout ships is something else. Yeah. And that's why, like, in my notes, I wrote down, what are they so mad about? Didn't they have to get permission for them to do this? But maybe not, because they did go to that sacred moon. So, yeah, yeah it didn't make a ton of sense, because they'd been talking. So, I guess, you know, before they met. So, I guess we didn't tell them, oh, by the way, we're looking for resources, and we're just going to, you know, poke yeah. around in your system and see what we find. <laughs> Is that a problem? Yeah, because then they could have told them, don't go to that moon. Do not go to that moon. They might have said, no, get out anyway, and I guess that was the other risk. Yeah. So the asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Well, I don't know. It just seems so funny to think about people owning planets right. and moons, but I get it. Well, I guess it's, it's probably similar to the concept of territorial waters around an island. The general sea is <laughs> rules of the ocean, right. and then... A, around your nation, the coastal waters are effectively part of the nation. So you could translate that to space and go, your solar system, that's yours. You right. know, nobody has a right to mess with it. And deep space, yeah, that's that's a free-for-all. That's anyone's. And working on that principle, you'd think Starfleet would be a little more respectful. But I guess in this case, you know, they are a little bit desperate. So maybe some of the protocols get shaved. Oh, we didn't think there were any habited planets in this system. Because of their resources, you're talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess you could easily say, oh, we didn't know that was yours. <laughs> Next thing. Yeah. Are these higher dimensional beings that take on a humanoid form for a limited time? Think of like the prophets or Q, where she says about how their energy in these, these bodies for a limited time. Are these some other dimensional race that take on humanoid form? Well... I guess I was just thinking this was just their tradition and they sort of like Tuvok explained, it was just their soul leaving their body. But it's kind of similar to that episode where they found all those bodies on that asteroid. Oh, yes. Right? Where yep. the, the energy from those people were going out into the actual thing around the asteroid. Right. And maybe it's the same thing here. Oh, it's a, it's a common thing in the Delta Quadrant. Maybe, because... She does say that, the, you know, the Mork was just a made-up story. So that yeah, wasn't something yeah. they believed in, really. Just obviously a legend. So, I don't know. It just seemed like kind of a religion for them. Oh. Or something to sort of maybe ease the transition. Well, what made me lead me towards is some kind of other higher dimensional race. They have a go at being a human for a bit. Was the way that she said that they're compelled to this planet. Yeah, that's true. And they seem true. to want to go into that cave. Mm -hmm. And when he found the remnants of the clothes, there was no bodies. There was no nothing decayed. So it was like they turned back into the energy. That's interesting. Okay, so yeah, maybe. I did think that the cave was a red herring. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, because there was no creature, I thought maybe yeah. the kids were just like, oh, he's in that cave. You know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe there's a thousand caves on that planet. And it could be any <laughs> cave, whatever, because there's not really a creature. Yeah, right. It's just wherever they land and wherever they're drawn to. I don't know. So it's that when she said they have an instinct to return to the planet. Yeah. It's not really that cave. It's the instinct is to return to the planet and go to a cave. And that's where they ascend. I, I guess. <laughs> well, because this led me on to something else. Yeah. The disturbance and energy field. Is this the energy of the crossed over Dreyans? Oh. And leading on from that, if they are this higher being and they're in this a part of this energy field, did the energy field force the shuttle to crash land where it did so these children could have an attendant in Tuvok? Well, now you're overanalyzing. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the yeah, so the shuttle crash was deliberate because they needed someone physical to look after the kids. It's so interesting. I didn't think of that because in that episode that I was talking about earlier, which I wish I could remember the name of with the asteroid. Asteroid of death. I did think that they were purposely applying a deeper meaning to yeah. it. But I didn't see it here, but I think you're onto something. That that actually makes a lot of sense. That it it is a thing that's going on. Yeah. Mm, oh, I like it. He's like, oh, wait, you got to come down here and help these kids, except they're not really kids. And I think my final point is, 
Mm -hmm. The rejection of technology. So they're not into technology anymore, but they still seem to have ships that mm -hmm. can travel within yeah. the solar system. Yeah. Where do they draw the line and the rejection? But I guess they can't ever improve them. I don't know. Maybe it's just the cult leaders are the ones who can oh, enjoy Lord. the technology. You know, they're sufficiently um, devout to make use of it. I don't think it ever works when they try to <laughs> remove technology. Like, I mean, how mad you were at the end of Battlestar Galactica. But it's like, okay. If, oh, yeah. I was more disappointed in the first two seasons of Picard. Even Elixis had to yeah. use technology to block technology. Oh, exactly. Right? So it, there was still no full rejection of it. And the reason she had to do that is because she was building this cult and she didn't have everybody's devotion <laughs> yet. I mean, she gets it eventually. She to make sure. They... But yeah, she's making sure that, you know, they do yeah. what she wants. But it's always that, right? We're rejecting it except for when I need to use it. Right. You know, the rules don't apply to me. That's what I was worried about with the first prelate. Yeah. At the same time, I do get you have to be able to protect yourself. Okay. I understand that. Especially in the Delta Quadrant. But again, if you've got people working on those ships, what are you telling them? Don't make it better? <laughs> it falls apart. Do not improve it. Yeah. And that, I think, wraps up my overanalysis. Yeah, very good overanalysis. I'm impressed that you came up with that. <laughs> Thank you. I only had two things in mind when yeah. we already talked about. Yeah. The one we haven't talked about yet is I felt like... Their costumes really aligned with the culture that they were trying to portray. Yeah. And I say that because there, I had that moment when they're in sick bay where it just seemed like they were like sucking the light out of the scene to disappear <laughs> into the wall. Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of what they want, right? They're trying to be less visible and they're trying to be hidden. And I thought, well, what a great job of lighting and costuming to reflect that right. as part of the characters. So I kind of thought that was cool. You know, I didn't, I really didn't pick up on that, but that's a great way of looking at it, of they want to be this understated. Mm -hmm. You can't see them. They're not really there. Yeah, and that's what was happening. <laughs> I may have totally made that up, but that's what I saw. That's a good one, but that is what they look like. Mm -hmm. So I don't have anything in Women in the Future. There wasn't any sexual harassment or anything to speak yeah. of, so that's fine. And I don't have anything in Janeway's Leadership Corner. I mean, I guess we can talk about Tuvok's parenting skills instead of <laughs> <laughs> leadership. <laughs> there was that cool moment where when the kid asks, don't you love your kids? And he explains that he feels incomplete without them. And the kid says yeah. back to him, I'm sure they miss you too, which was very <laughs> cute. And he does sort of make a face. Right. But I would say that in the moment where those kids were really irritating him, you could see he was annoyed. Now, you're not supposed right. to have those emotions, but they were clearly sort of getting to him because he was trying to accomplish a task and these kids were not allowing it. So I am pretty sure he complained about that later on his podcast. Oh, yes, yes. Emotional children are far much more effort to deal with than Vulcan children. Yeah, they're just so inefficient. Who understand from an early age how grim the world is. Although maybe he has to completely relook at that because they're not children. Oh, yes. But <laughs> they've reached a point in their lives where they have the innocence of children. I always tell the story of there was a point with my mom where she was looking through her camera at the sunset to take a picture. And this was a, a single lens camera, which yeah. means she was actually looking at the sun with her <laughs> naked eye. And I said to her, Mom, stop looking at the sun. And she was like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. And I, at that moment, I was like, oh, it's changed. I am now the parent and she is now the child. Oh. So I kind of related to that yeah. in, this, uh, in this episode. And I mean, that was like the very first moment. There have been many moments since. And that was a long time ago. And I still have many conversations with her where I'm like, mom, OK, let's not do that. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I always love it when she'll tell me, no, remember we talked about it and we decided this. It's like, yes, I do remember we talked about it, but we decided something completely different. But anyway, <laughs> it does happen. Then let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating for this episode? Thumbs up. Absolutely great episode. And I think it hits because of two different things here. Mm -hmm. I really liked the bond that Tuvok was developing with these children as individuals. Yeah. Even though he's Vulcan and feelings are irrelevant, Russ's performance really demonstrated that Vulcans do feel. Tuvok was, had empathy for their plight and actually wanted to help and started developing this attachment to them. But Russ didn't show any real outward emotions. It was how a Vulcan would do it. It would be very subtle and it would be done in such a way that you could deny it. 
oh, I wasn't attached to the children. I was just merely doing what I felt was my duty. Mm, yeah. I really like that. And then the second thing of this episode is I got this feeling that what Tuvok was dealing with here was his own children, probably reminding them of his own. Because out of all the people on Voyager, he's likely to be the only one alive when they get home. Tuvok is 105 years old. I think it is 106 years old, around there. In 70 years, he'll be fine. He'll, st he'll still be alive. Spock's dad lived to 200 and something. So Tuvok's children, by that point, will be <laughs> mature Vulcans. So his interaction with actual children, this mm. would remind him he's missing his children growing up and how they make him complete. He loves them. He just can't say it as a Vulcan. <laughs> or feel it. So this has to be a thumbs up. I think this was one of those episodes of, it just added so much to the character of Tuvok. Hmm. Okay. So thumbs up. Thoroughly enjoyable. Okay. I didn't think it was a great episode. I, th I thought really? it was a good Star Trek episode. Yeah. You actually, in this conversation, you've made it better for me. I understand it <laughs> a little bit more now because yeah. you did more analysis on it maybe than I was doing as I was watching it. Yeah. Not exactly sure why. Maybe because for most of the episode, you're just like, oh, kids. You know, it's right, a, it's a right. kid episode, whatever. But then you realize, oh, no, there's so much more here at the end. Yes. I do agree that Tim Russ is very good in it. And I really, I really liked him. So, I mean, I'll definitely give it a thumbs up. I think it's good. It's a good episode. Yeah. In some ways, it's an odd episode because it leads you down a path. You're thinking this is a Star Trek kids episode. And it also leads you down a path of thinking, oh, they're going to do something nasty. These kids are sacrifices to the Morok. <laughs> you know, something like that. And the real turnabout at the end is like, wow, okay. I really thought they were shape-shifting aliens for a long time. <laughs> <sighs> we murdered and ate the attendants. They were our food. Either way, it's still different than what you expect when it, yes. when it starts. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that wraps up, I think, season two, episode 22. Come back next week for episode 23. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com, or you can reach out to us on social media. We are on threads, Instagram, YouTube, and Blue Sky. Yep. Or you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. And don't ban books.